Each of these disciplines has a very rich history on its own, science as well as theological studies as well. But it's also very important that people learn how to distinguish science from religion. And that's one of the things that we try to do in the program. But there are areas where, believe it or not, they actually do overlap, where scientific knowledge influences religious views, and where religious views can come in and influence science, or the conclusion that, that the scientist might reach. I have Mike Behe, who is professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University. He's not wearing a flannel shirt this evening, so, so it took me a while to recognize him there. Um, Bill Dembski was not able to make it in some of the early advertising we had him on the program, but uh, pinch hitting for him is Steve Meyer, who's director of the Center for Science and Culture, division of the, of the Discovery Institute. Paul Nelson, then at the far end, he's an adjunct professor with me here, actually, in the Science and Religion program. And that's no reason for you guys to go easy on him, okay? <laughs> so, um, and then also Guillermo Gonzalez, who is the author of The Privileged Planet and is uh, assistant research professor of astronomy at Iowa State University. So, and last but not least, Jonathan Wells, author of Icons of Evolution, is here. From the critic's side, we have Anthony Flew, British philosopher. He's author of God and Philosophy. He flew all the way across the English, beyond the English Channel, across the <laughs> pond, um, in order to be here. Last night, we gave him award, a Johnson Award for Liberty and Truth. So, uh, since he was here anyhow, he was uh, quite interested in being involved with the panel on this this evening. Then we have Larry Herber, the other end of the table there. He's a geologist from Cal Poly Pomona. He's retired, he says, but I have a feeling he still keeps very busy. Jim Hoffman is chair of the Liberal Studies Department, Cal State Fullerton. Dr. Charlotte Laws is a columnist and author. I think you can tell who she is. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Morrison is here from Dateline NBC as well. Then Craig Nelson, also from Cal State Fullerton, lecturer in the Liberal Studies and Comparative Religion Department. And Bruce Weber, biochemist, is here as well. So these are our two panels. The basic format for this evening is that of a press conference where these people to my left will be the questioners, the inquirers, and people to the right will be responding to the questions. Uh, but with any press conference, there's usually some brief introduction given. That's what Steve Meyer will do here in a moment. And the goal of Steve's introduction is to give you as the audience some sense of what is intelligent design, and so on. I've been asked, as John said, to give an opening statement about uh, the theory of intelligent design to explain what it is. Um, if you've seen anything in the media, you might have uh, heard that intelligent design is science masquerading as religion. Uh, you might have heard that uh, some of us don't dress very well. We're creationists in cheap tuxedos. Uh, 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 but I want to give a different uh, perspective on that and tell you what we think it is. Uh, and perhaps the best way to explain what the theory of intelligent design is is to contrast it with uh, the, uh, the, the key claim on the other side of the argument from the neo-Darwinians. Uh, Richard Dawkins, one of the leading spokesmen for Darwinism in the world, has said that biology is the study of complicated things that have, give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Um, Quick pop quiz. What's the key the key word in that uh, appearance? Okay, in that in that quotation, Dawkins, uh, like many uh, Darwinists, says that that uh, acknowledges that biological systems look designed, but he says that d that appearance of design is illusory because there's a purely undirected process, namely natural selection, acting on random mutations of various kinds that can produce that appearance without there being any actual guidance or intelligence behind it. Um, and that is the proposition that the theory of intelligent design is challenging. We're not necessarily challenging the idea of evolution per se. Certainly we're not challenging the idea of evolution meaning change over time, nor are we necessarily challenging the idea of evolution as common ancestry. But we are challenging this specifically Darwinian or neo-Darwinian idea that life appears designed, 
but is not really designed, again, because there is this powerful undirected process that produced that appearance. So um, uh, Darwinism and neo-Darwinism have insisted that the appearance of design in living organisms is illusory. Uh, by contrast, we hold that there are certain features of living systems that can be best explained by the activity of a, uh, a designing intelligence rather than an undirected natural process, such as natural selection and random mutation. For us, living systems look designed because they really were designed. Now, maybe a simpler way to say that is that there are certain indicators or pointers or evidences that point to a prior intelligent cause, and you can see those in the scientific evidence. So the issue that intelligent design is raising is simply this. Is design real? or is it illusory? We hold that it's real. Our Darwinian colleagues, as opposed to generic evolutionists, hold the opposite. Now, why do we say this? Why do we say that design is real, not illusory? Well, we say it because there are some discoveries in modern science and biology, and also we'll hear from Guillermo Gonzalez in the physical sciences as well, but I'm going to speak mostly in this short opener about the biology. There's some discoveries that Darwin didn't know about. In particular, inside biological cells, which in the 19th century were thought to be simple homogeneous globules of plasm, to quote T.H. Huxley, one of Darwin's contemporaries, uh, scientists have discovered nanotechnology, little tiny miniature machines, circuits, and information processing systems. Uh, the image behind me is of a machine called an APT synthase, which is essentially an energy-driven uh, turbine. It runs on the same principles as a dam, but the, the, uh, this, the energy that is produced by this turbine is driven by a flow of ions. There's a sophisticated mechanical coupling device that's responsible for building ATP, the battery pack of the cell. It's a very sophisticated little machine. Uh, there are also circuits in cells. Michael Behe has made a number of these famous in his book, Darwin's Black Box. And of course, he's also made famous other machines like this bacterial flagellar motor, a true rotary engine with rotors and stators and O-rings and drive shafts and bushings and bearings and a whip-like propeller. Uh, Behe has defined systems like this as irreducibly complex, by which he means systems that have a number of well-matched parts that are functionally integrated such that the loss of any particular part in this system causes the whole to lose function. Uh, he has argued that natural selection and random mutation do not produce systems like this, and further argued that these systems provide evidence of design. Um, there is also another uh, design argument in biology, and this is the argument from digital information, or what we sometimes refer to as specified complexity. It turns out that in the cell, like in a computer program, the, 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 the show is run by information. I asked, used to ask my students, if you want to get your computer to perform a new function, what do you have to give it? And uh, they would know, almost better than uh, anyone over 40, uh, you have to give it new code. And the same thing turns out to be true in life. If you want to build a new living organism from a pre-existing form, or if you want to build life in the first place, you have to provide information. Take this flagellar motor I, I put up a minute ago. It's made of protein parts. The proteins are in turn made of amino acids. The amino acids only fold and form functional parts if they are arranged in the precise sequence. And that sequence is in turn uh, determined and governed and constructed by the information that's stored in the molecule DNA, which literally is a form of digital code. It contains a digital code with the assembly instructions for building those critical proteins. So a, cr a critical question in the history of life, both at the point of the origin of the first life and at the point of certain uh, significant events such as the Cambrian explosion, uh, where you find fundamentally new forms arising, is where did the new information come from that is necessary to build life and to build those new forms? Uh, we have argued that that information is best explained by reference to a prior intelligent cause. Uh, and part of our reason for doing so is the nature of the information itself. Richard Dawkins has pointed out that the information in biology is, is like the information in software code. It's a machine code, he says. Bill Gates has said the same, that DNA is like a computer program, but far more advanced than any we've ever created. We know from experience that computer programs are built by programmers. We know more generally that information always arises from conscious activity, as 
one early molecular uh, information scientist who applied information science to molecular biology pointed out, the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. Now, this is a very significant <coughs> observation because one of the key rules in scientific reasoning about the past in the historical sciences is that we should uh, look for presently acting causes, that our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world in the present should guide our inferences about the past. This is the famous dictum, the uniformitarian dictum of Charles Lyell, one of Darwin's mentors. And his idea was that when we're trying to explain the past, we should not invent causes, exotic causes, the effects of which we've never seen, but instead we should explain the past by reference to causes that we see presently in operation. And when I was studying Lyell, and Darwin and the methods of the historical sciences during my graduate work in England, I asked myself the question, what is the presently acting cause of digital information? The pre and I submit that it is intelligence. We know that from re uniform and repeated experience, the basis of all knowledge. And in a similar way, we can ask the question about irreducibly complex systems. We know from experience when we find such systems, whether they're integrated circuit boards or internal combustion engines, invariably an intelligence played a role. So the argument from intellig or for intelligent design is not based on ignorance or just a critique of what naturalistic models like neo-Darwinism cannot do, but instead it's based on our positive knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. So contrary to what you might have heard in the media, that the idea of the intelligent design is the idea that life is so complex it must have been produced by a, a, a supernatural designer, intelligent design is not arguing from ignorance, it's arguing from our positive knowledge. It's not just a punt because we can't imagine how, how these systems arose, rather it's based on our knowledge of what it always takes to build systems that have information rich um, uh, uh, code or information processing systems or irreducibly complex systems. So the basis of intelligent design is not religion, as is often asserted, but rather it's the discovery of molecular machines and circuits and cells the discovery of digital information and an inform information processing system in the cell, and in physics, the discovery of the fine-tuning of the laws of and constants of physics, which I haven't had a chance to talk about. And finally, it's based on inferences from these evidences that are based on standard modes of scientific reasoning in which our knowledge of cause and effect guides our reconstructions of the past. So we submit intelligent design is a fully scientific theory, and we'll leave it to our critics to uh, bring it on. <laughs>